British people are not being told the truth about the real problems in their economy. And false problems lead to false solutions. We have been told since 2008 that the critical obstacle to overcome is the government deficit and the debt that it has built up. We have been told that the answer to this is cutting government spending. Austerity. In this short film we will explain firstly what the real problems in the economy are and secondly, once those are understood, it becomes clear why austerity cannot possibly work. You cannot possibly balance the nation's books by simply cutting government spending. First, we need to understand Britain's trade deficit. Britain's trade balance is not in good shape at the moment. We're running a deficit of about £40 billion a year and that's made up of a surplus on services but a much bigger deficit on manufactured goods. Uh, and that's why we have this very substantial deficit which runs on year after year. The problem we have is that every pound of current account deficit we have has to be financed by borrowing or selling assets and that's what we've been doing for many years. This is why we've sold off huge quantities of our companies and our rail franchises and our property in this country uh, to finance the standard of living which we're not earning. The UK economy is very badly unbalanced. This is why it is growing so slowly and why wages for many people have not grown in real terms for 10 years. Here's what's wrong. We invest much too little. We do not produce enough goods to pay our way in the world. To plug the gap every year, we sell assets and run up more and more debt. What growth we have is based on asset inflation and not trade and investment. We suffer from substantial regional imbalances and inequality. One of the perennial problems in the UK economy is that growth can be imbalanced. It was highlighted by the financial crisis in 2008 that highlighted the imbalance and the over reliance on the financial sector. In recent years, the imbalance has been very much seen in terms of both a big budget deficit and a large current account deficit. It's important to stress, this is not new. When I started in the city in the late 1980s, then I was chief economist at Swiss Bank Corporation. And I pointed out in the Times that a UK trade deficit mattered more than a UK budget surplus. And I said the Lawson boom as a result would become a bust. And that was correct. And the reality is that ever since, we still try and wrestle with this problem. We don't save enough, we don't invest enough. So an imbalanced economy is a deep-rooted challenge. We are told that the way ahead is to cut government spending. But austerity is not the answer. Now, in terms of austerity, austerity doesn't work if it's the only thing you try and do. You can't squeeze the economy to be smaller. But we need to have a very balanced approach because it's not only a large budget deficit, it's not only a large current account deficit, it's also the fact that the private sector households, often against the backdrop of sluggish wage growth, accumulate large amounts of debt. First, it is much easier to get productivity increases, which lead to growth and real wage increase, from manufacturing than from services. Second, most of our exports are goods, not services, and we do not make enough at the moment to pay our way in the world. Third, manufacturing jobs pay much better than too many low productivity, insecure service sector jobs. If you compare manufacturing jobs with service jobs, what you'll find is that the average pay in manufacturing is about 25% higher than it is in the rest of the economy. Uh, Manufacturing produces about 10% of GDP from 8% of the labour force, which illustrates how much more productive it is and how much higher wages it can therefore uh, pay. Well, it, it's late as 1970, uh, nearly a third of British GDP came from manufacturing. And then it fell uh, by 1990 to about 18%, uh, nearly halving, but then it's nearly halved again between uh, 1990 and the present time down to less than 10%. So there's been an enormous 
drop in the percentage of GDP coming from manufacturing over the last 30 or 40 years. There is only one way to get enough manufacturing back to enable us to balance our books. We need a much lower exchange rate. The pound went down from about $1.45 to $1.25 after the EU referendum. And this is why the economy has done so much better than most people expected since then. Well, of course, since the Brexit referendum vote, the pound has come off, but not as dramatically as some people think it has. And in fact, it's improved a bit recently. It's about 130 against the dollar now. Well, it was about 145 before the referendum. Against the euro, where are we now? 116, 17. Well, it was about 120, 25 before the referendum. So there has been a devaluation. It's, what, 10% or whatever. I think this is wholly beneficial. And in fact, if you look at the survey information, whether it's the market surveys and manufacturing, or whether it's the CBI surveys, or indeed the Bank of England's agents report, they're all suggesting that actually export orders look very buoyant. This is a good thing. But $1.25 is still too high to get most manufacturing recited back in the UK. For this to happen, we need to get the pound down to about one pound equals one dollar. Could we do it? Of course, we could, if we really tried. And what would happen then? Investment would pour into UK manufacturing to take advantage of new profitable opportunities. The economy would start to grow much faster. Wages would go up. We could balance the books and stop running up debts. We could invest much more in schools, hospitals, roads, and housing, all the opposite of austerity policies. So why don't we do it? I think there's just been a long history in this country of uh, adherence to both economic theories and sort of practical views about the uh, getting a high value for your pound when you go on holidays, which have just blinded people to the necessity for making sure that actually we can be competitive in this world. And the only way to make us be competitive is to charge our, our costs out to the, the rest of the world at a lower rate. Exchange rate policy is crucial. Yet for many decades, we have ignored this vital policy key to running the economy because of economic ideas which have had their day. And we ignore it because it doesn't suit certain interests to fix it. Well, if we're going to see the country re-industrializing, which I think is essential to get the economy rebalanced, we've got to have an exchange rate which makes it profitable to invest in light industry. And I think that's somewhere around about a dollar, maybe a dollar five. Now, because we've had an overvalued currency for some time, we've tended to regard lower cost manufacturing as not being possible here in the UK. But if you have a significant adjustment in the currency, as we are seeing, then it makes a reassessment of the outlook become more relevant. Well, what's happened to manufacturing in this country is that it's fallen from being almost a third of GDP as late as 1970 to being less than 10% now. And this has happened partly because interest rates and monetary policy in this country has been so tight, and partly because we've sold off huge quantities of assets, which has pushed the exchange rate way too high. Part of the reason why it has been so high for so long is that the UK has had for years a policy of selling its companies, its rail franchises, its harbours, its airports, its utilities and its housing to foreign interests on a scale unmatched by any other developed country in the world. Now, the UK is unique in the way it's sold off assets to enable us to enjoy a standard of living which is more than we're actually earning. And over the last few years we've sold off our ports and airports, we've sold off our rail franchises, our, uh, our uh, football clubs, uh, chocolate factories, everything to enable us to carry on living beyond our means. And this can't go on. 
So the only way to get our economy rebalanced, to increase investment, to enable us to re-industrialise and pay our way in the world, to stop running up debts, to get the economy to grow fast enough to raise real wages and to produce much better jobs, especially outside London and the South East, is to make manufacturing industry pay again. And this is almost entirely an exchange rate issue. I did take the view that like, the, the collapse of manufacturing in the early 80s was an absolutely shocking mistake in this country. And that was partly because the exchange rate was so disgustingly and disgracefully overvalued. Um, but having said that, I think that I, I actually do take, the, I do take the point that it's a good idea to try and increase manufacturing as a percentage of GDP question. How do you do it? There's plenty that we can uh, uh, execute to make sure that this happens. First of all, we can make it more difficult for foreign interests to buy property in this country by using the tax system, perhaps by charging people quite high sums of money if they buy property in this country and keep them uh, unoccupied. Uh, we can get the Bank of England to take a different attitude than it has up till now, by and large. The Bank of England has tended to try to keep the pound up rather than keep it down. We need to get that reversed. Maybe we should have a withholding tax to make it less attractive to hold assets in this country. But above all, I think what we need to do is to have a government which is prepared to realise that we need a competitive exchange rate and that runs the uh, country in a way that keeps it there, make it very clear that that's their settled policy uh, to keep it at a level which is competitive. And this is no more than lots of other countries in the world do. It's not an extraordinary policy to pursue that nobody else has done. It's what successful countries throughout the world actually do to make sure that their, their, their economies remain competitive. What would rebalancing the economy and the exchange rate mean for ordinary people? Well, wages have been uh, static in this country for the last 10 years partly because whatever growth we've had has tended to go to people who are really well off already rather than the average person, but mainly because the amount of investment that we've made into areas of the economy which actually produce more output per hour have been far too low. The main reasons why this has happened is that the UK economy has grown only very slowly over the last few years and what growth there has been has been concentrated mostly in London and the South East. There is now a huge disparity between earnings in different parts of the country. But a key thing in the imbalance of the UK economy is the need to boost non-London parts of the economy. Um, London's productivity is 79% higher than the rest of the economy, largely because of the financial sector. London accounts for a quarter of the economy. Britain is incredibly unbalanced regionally and from a socio democratic point of view. Uh, for example, the gross value added per employee in London uh, is down £44,000 a year, whereas in the North East it's less than half that at £19,000 a year. So that just gives you some idea of how unbalanced the British economy really is now. The problem is that most of the country does not have enough to sell to the rest of the world to pay its way. As a result, most places in the UK depend on London and the South East for grants, loans and transfers to make ends meet. This wasn't always the case. Interestingly, the North has tended to be richer in the past than the South. Until about the 1960s, living standards in the North of England were higher than they were in London and the South East. It's all changed round in the last 30 or 40 years with globalisation. And now the North and uh, Set in the north of England and the Midlands is now distinctly poorer than the uh, London area and the South East. It's a huge, huge change that's taken place over the last 30 or 40 years. And this points to what the solution needs to be. We need to get at least a reasonable amount of manufacturing industry back to the UK. As late as 1970, almost a third of our national income came from manufacturing. Even in 1990, it was about 20%. Now it is less than 10%, and this is just not viable. 
To get the economy rebalanced and to get wages moving upwards again for most people, especially outside London and the South East, we need to get it back up to about 15%. How can we get this done? Basically, it is simple. We have to make low and medium tech manufacturing profitable again. And to do this, we need an exchange rate which makes it as cheap to manufacture most goods in the UK than it is in the Far East or in the successful manufacturing economies on the continent of Europe, such as Germany and Holland. How low would the pound have to be? It was about $1.45 before the EU referendum. It is about $1.25 now. It needs to come down about the same amount again, to $1 or perhaps $1.05. What would happen if we had an exchange rate like this? Because it would make a wide range of manufacturing in the UK profitable again, it would attract investment and create good quality jobs all over the country, replacing some of the 4 million manufacturing jobs which we have lost since the 1970s. Even now, despite the very harsh way in which it has been treated in the UK, wages in manufacturing average about 25% more than they do for the economy as a whole. Competition from manufacturing would then force the service sector to raise wages and to improve conditions as well, so that everyone should be better off. Well, I think it would obviously make sense to locate new manufacturing facilities mainly outside London and the South East, because these are the areas which need the jobs most and where the costs are likely to be lowest, and therefore they're the most sensible places for new industrial activity to uh, be located. I think if we pursued the kind of policy which uh, we advocate, what we would find is that the jobs that were on offer, particularly outside London and the South East, uh, were much more secure, they were better paid, uh, they would produce more job satisfaction, and they would produce a much better climate generally of uh, uh, the balance between the way the country uh, operates in the South East and the London and the North East and North West, we would have a more united country as a result of all this. The only way to get wages up is to increase productivity, and it is because increase in output per hour using mechanisation and technology are so much easier to achieve in manufacturing than they are in services that reindustrialization is key to improving overall working conditions. Do you remember the fear campaign to which we were all subjected prior to the EU referendum? We were told that the economy would collapse if we voted to leave. Well, the day after we voted to leave saw big, big changes in the exchange rate and in the stock exchange. Uh, the stock exchange went way down but bounced right back. The exchange rate went down and stayed down and I think actually this has been one of the major reasons why the performance of the British economy has been much better since the referendum vote than most of the experts said it would be. Uh, we had all kinds of warnings of disaster from the Bank of England and the Treasury and the OECD and the IMF. It just didn't happen. And I think it's because actually the lower exchange rate made the British economy more competitive. Well, prior to the referendum, I was absolutely appalled by so-called Project Fear. And, of course, it was a concerted effort by the economics establishment to frighten people into voting against Brexit. But there were just some of us that actually said this is nonsense. Uh, in, the, in the event of the vote itself, the economy will not change that much. Fair enough, the pound might come off a bit, and it has done. But I don't think that's a particularly negative, I think that's a positive. Well, the economy has reacted by getting itself rather more rebalanced than it was before, in particular exports went up very, very sharply. By the last quarter of 2016, exports were about 16% higher than they had been a year previously, whereas imports really hardly rose at all. Uh, so that was a big improvement. And I think that's really what's driven the relatively successful outcomes in the economy that we've seen over the last few months. 
And when I keep hearing about, oh my goodness me, the exchange rates fall and this means that people's wages are going to fall because inflation is going to touch two and a half to three percent, I just shake my head in despair. Do these people want to have a better balanced economy, yes or no? And after all, this, this impact of the lower exchange rate on inflation will be a temporary thing. And a year, two, three years' time, it will have actually fed through. So I think, on the whole, the fact that the pound has come off is wholly beneficial. Since the UK referendum last summer, the pound has fallen. In my view, it would have weakened anyway, whatever happened in the referendum, because of the imbalance in the economy, and in particular because of the very large trade deficit and the very large current account deficit. So the currency adjusting weaker through a devaluation is a very important part of the adjustment mechanism towards making the economy more balanced. So there were just a few of us, we lonely souls who are not part of the economics establishment of this country, who thought Project Fear was an utter disgrace. And I'm delighted to say that so far, so good. Why did this happen? There were two main reasons. The first was that while the Remain side was really depressed by the referendum result, 52% of the electorate were delighted with it. Remainers therefore anticipated gloom and despondency, falling consumer confidence, all making the economy tank, and convinced themselves that everyone would think the same way as them. Actually, of course, more than half the population were pleased with the referendum result and their spending went up. I think the biggest downside of all the scaremongering that took place before the referendum is that it has made businesses more reluctant to invest than they otherwise would have been. And I think that is not helping the economy at all. I think if we hadn't had all these dire warnings, investment now would have been higher than it has been. The second major factor which undoubtedly helped the economy after the referendum result was the fall in the pound from about $1.45 to $1.25. This has made our exports more competitive, producing especially good results for the car industry, which saw record production levels. Overseas sales leapt up while imports stayed flat. Exports for the last quarter of 2016 were 16% higher than they had been the year previously, showing what could be achieved if the pound was even lower. We now have two years of Brexit negotiations ahead of us, Hopefully they will produce a good deal for everyone. Mills believes the best outcome would be for the UK to be out of the single market, the European Economic Area and the EU Customs Union, but with free trade deals with the EU 27. Well, I think the best outcome on Brexit would be for us to come out of the single market, out of the uh, European Economic Area, out of the Customs Union, and to have a free trade deal. And I think there's a 50-50 chance that that's what's going to happen. If we don't, then I think we may be offered quite harsh terms from the European Union, where we'd be better off coming out altogether and adopting what's called the World Trade Organization option. But then I think a huge amount is going to depend on what happens to the exchange rate. If that comes down again, like it did after the Brexit vote in June 2016, I think you may well see the economy really bouncing forward. And that would be a really good outcome, I think, from the Brexit negotiations. The really key requirement is that we retain our capacity to choose an exchange rate which will keep us competitive. This is by far the best way of ensuring that whatever the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, our economy keeps on growing, that wages go up, and the UK strives to become an open and prosperous place to live for all our citizens. Finally, to summarise, what the UK must face to up to is its real economic problems. The status quo is not sustainable and austerity is absolutely not the route to prosperity or balanced books. We need to increase our exports, reduce our imports and actually pay our way in the world. If this country continues to rack up huge trade deficits, as it done in the past, I don't think it's sustainable. At some point you will get to the point where other people who actually finance the deficit at the moment will say 
this country is not sustainable. Since I started working in the city in October 1985, one of the best lead indicators for any country anywhere in the world is their trade and current account deficit. If it is large and continues to remain large, then it's a go good lead indicator often of potential problems in that country or issues that need to be addressed. For Britain, I think the trade and current account deficit can be sustained in the sense that international investors still have confidence in Britain, but they highlight underlying issues that do need to be sort of brought to the fore, and in particular the need to rebalance the economy. So I think the trade and current account deficit are very important signals and we should spend more time focusing not only on them, but on the lessons that come from them. The clearest route to achieving this is by having a more competitive exchange rate allowing the economy to be rebalanced with a much bigger chunk of our economy moving into manufacturing. This has very clear benefits, not just for the trade deficit, but for the country and its citizens as a whole. I don't think you can go on running a big trade deficit forever. Sooner or later, you'll run out of the assets that you have to sell to finance it, or run out of the borrowing capacity you've got, and the pound will fall. It seems to me to be much more sensible to recognise the dangers we're in and to get the exchange rate to some more realistic level early rather than wait until in the end the markets just turn against us and the pound crashes. Firstly, running a large trade deficit just cannot go on forever. A correction is needed. Secondly, a push towards more manufacturing would provide many of the decent and stable jobs that our country is desperate for. Thirdly, this would stimulate growth and increases in productivity, both essential for clearing the deficit and raising wages, living standards and the tax base. So all of these issues come together. What it means is that you need to look beyond austerity. You need to try and have some quick wins, but more importantly, it's about a longer term structural approach about the economy saving more and investing more in competing globally so that our exports of goods and services can continue to do well in the fast-growing global markets of the future. I think a lot of the trouble is that our macroeconomic policies have been out of balance. I mean, any government really should look at its balance between monetary policy on the one hand and fiscal policy on the other hand, though they actually do try and engineer one way or another a competitive exchange rate. The exchange rate shouldn't just be ignored when a government is thinking about balancing monetary and fiscal policy. And there have been at least a couple of times in our history when this currency has been ridiculously overvalued, mainly because we've been running huge, high interest rates very much at the expense of the exchange rate. I remember it's the early 80s and when we were in the ERM in the early 90s, and I remember criticising it very hard at the time, but nobody seemed to bother. And finally, considerable evidence now exists that flogging all your national assets is damaging to the economy. Reducing the tax base, reducing jobs in research and development, and reducing democratic control. Free market dogma simply hasn't worked in the real world. Restricting such asset sales would not only aid the exchange rate, it would have far wider economic benefits. I think the result of the EU referendum last summer was a real wake-up call for this country that we cannot go on running our affairs the way we have done for many years, that we really need some radical changes. And I think the most important change of all we need to make is to make the economy more competitive so that we can pay our way in the world. It really is time for Britain to get a grip on its economy. Politicians talk about a strong pound. It may be strong for the city, but for ordinary people and workers, nothing would improve our economy more than moving to a much more competitive pound. Better jobs, better wages, better security, a better country. I think politicians who praise a strong pound just simply don't understand how the economy works. <laughs>